Okay, great. So Rafa, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, so could you start by telling us a little bit about yourself, kind of your journey, and tell us a little bit about Thrive, which is something you're involved in right now? Uh, yes, so I'm uh, originally from Yemen. I was uh, born and raised there uh, until I was 16. That's when my journey as an international student began because uh, that's when I went to university. Um, and since then, I've uh, lived in many countries and I came to Canada six years ago. Uh, it feels like it was yesterday, but it's been six years. And, you know, being an international student, I got to um, experience a lot of things. And it's different from all the other experiences that I've had. I've noticed a lot of gap in information out there. Um, I spoke to friends who got scammed um you know this international students getting scammed was something that's very regular and you know would be mentioned a lot of times mm -hmm. um so that's when my partner and i um we were like you know what we need a community we need one source of information that mm -hmm. students can go to um and you know that one source of information that's unbiased and honest and um, is by people who have experienced what they're going to experience or what they're already experiencing yeah so that's how thrive magazine came to be um and you know our mission is to become the number one source of information for international students that's incredible. And I, I really, you know, I really admire the fact that you've gone out and created that community because, you know, I've, I've worked a lot with international students and, and you know, I, I know you've experienced that a lot as well as an international student and that lack of community, that lack of, you know, just not knowing your surroundings and your environment, like that can be really scary. And like you said, you know, people are exposed to, to scams, to, you know, um, discrimination. Uh, and it's really great that they have a voice and a platform and it's uh, it's wonderful that you're providing that for that community. Um, so thinking a little bit about your journey as an international student, Rafa, what were some of the, the challenges that you faced? And, you know, maybe we can talk about in terms of the language, first of all, um, and, and how did you overcome them personally? We can maybe start with your own personal um, reflection. Uh, I grew up bilingual. Mm -hmm. But even I, I, was, I was never good at languages, so I've never actually mastered any of the languages that I, I speak. Um, but even though I my entire life, my education was in English, coming to Canada was different. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, I th there was a lot of doubt. And because of the doubt, you tend to hesitate, forget your grammar. You know, it, and, and that's from someone that was already very familiar with the language. So I could only imagine what students that don't know the language come here to learn it. Um, right. And in your and, experience, what what are the kind of, you know, when it comes to the language, what are the, the things that international students struggle with or find, you know, tricky moving to Canada or a new country? From what I've um, noticed is that, and, and that's something I'm experiencing until this day, is that we're not fully immersed in the culture. We don't mm -hmm. get to you know, have conversations with uh, native uh, English native speakers. We don't get to, I think I've been here six years and I have like three Canadian friends. Um, and that, and that is a um, happy problem because that means that Vancouver is like very multicultural and you get to meet people from all over the world. But at the end of the day, we are engaging with each other and we're not fully immersed in the language. Right. And uh students then would go to work and you know at work you will start having you're going to start meeting more uh native speakers or you know um people with really good english and that's when it hits you it's like oh i've been here god knows how long but i'm still not i'm not there yet yeah no that that makes a lot of sense and it kind of ties back to what you said and you know why you created thrive because that community is lacking that support is lacking and being able to integrate into canadian culture you might study in canada you might work in canada you might have friends who've lived in canada for a few years but 
it's very difficult to kind of, you know, immerse yourself in that. And that's, you know, as we know, that's the best way to, to learn a language and to really improve your language skills. So um, obviously, you, you know, you came here initially as a student and then obviously, you know, you, you started your own kind of community and your own, you know, business and everything like that, which is, which is really, really amazing. It's a great example. But thinking back to, you know, new international students who maybe move to a new country, you know, how can, how can our audience as teachers, how can they support these students and what are some strategies that they can put in place to help them feel included and help them feel, you know, valued as students? For sure, cultural exchange. I think that um, we have different cultures and mm -hmm. even though until this day, uh, I have many friends from different cultures and I'm still learning more and more about those cultures. And I think what uh, teachers can do is that they can take that extra step, you know, um, have that cultural exchange, um, show that, show the students that they have a place, there is space for them. They can, you know, feel that sense of belonging. Um, and maybe that will lead them to be more comfortable and that could result to them being more open towards um, learning, you know? And, and I think culture is really, um, the bridge there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And, and I think a lot of, a lot of teachers maybe don't recognize the value of taking time to get to know your students and learning a little bit about their background, about their culture. And, and just because you've taught a student from that country doesn't mean that they're going to be the same as previous students you've taught from that country. So I think yeah. that's really important for sure. Um, for example, yeah, um, please. Yeah, go ahead. Let's, just, let's just say that um, not asking questions, you know, asking questions in class for some cultures, it, you know, can be deemed as being rude uh, mm -hmm. or disrespectful. And uh, you know, um, if instructors or teachers, I mean, l listen, um, ESL teachers are doing a great job. You know, I'm not an ESL teacher. I was never an ESL teacher, but um, I can only share my experience as an international student and learning from our community at Thrive. Um, so it's understanding that culture, taking that one extra step, understanding that some cultures, you know, for example, shame, um, feeling that sense of like that shame when you make a mistake. If you mm -hmm. say something, if you pronounce something in the wrong way, there that could completely close you off and you don't want to learn anymore. Um, and if teachers understand that, they can navigate around it. Right. That's a yeah, that's really, really powerful. And again, you know, if we take the time and we understand and we learn and reflect from previous experiences, then we can definitely do that. And I think it goes into creating that environment as well, that safe environment where students feel nurtured and valued, which you mentioned as well. So um, I think, yeah, I think that's something really powerful. Take time to get to know students, give them opportunities to share their experiences, mm -hmm. share, you know, their, their culture and, and ask ask questions, but don't ask questions for the sake of asking questions. Ask them to learn, to listen, to understand them. I, that this is something I, I really value and try to put in my, in my teaching approach as well, um, because I think it, it's really powerful and it, it helps. You know, if you have students who are excited and motivated and they want to come to class every day, then they're going to be more likely to want to speak English, to try new things, to push themselves, to, you know, go out of their comfort zone. So, that's really, really valuable advice. So thank you for, for sharing that, Rafa. So let's talk a little bit more about confidence. So from your experience and, and from conversations you've had, um, what are some things teachers could maybe do to help, you know, new students or international students develop confidence and, and self-efficacy? Um, because they, you know, there's a lot of skills that students need that they don't necessarily learn. So how can teachers help support them in that? Um we will always have that doubt we'll always think do we have what it takes to go up there to order a drink at starbucks um to be able to you know say hello in the many different ways that we say hello in english and i think role playing is very important in the classroom um you know something that is very uh 
real life experience. Like I said, go to a coffee shop. You'd go to a coffee shop. Hey, how are you? How are you doing? You know, there's so many ways of us uh, saying how mm -hmm. are you and how and, and you replying to that. And, you know, uh, students might only know one way or two ways. But then if they hear one more way, they freeze or they feel embarrassed. Mm -hmm. uh, so role playing, I think, is very important and also giving like detailed feedback. Um, yeah. uh, I, I think feedback is something that we learn. And if it's detailed, there's no room for fear or assumptions. Right. And it's that learning through failure and learning through making mistakes and not even not even saying failure, because that isn't really the right word. But it's, you know, every time you try something new, you learn from it, even if it's right or wrong or it's successful or it isn't. It's a learning opportunity. And yeah, like I know my students love going to, you know, Tim Hortons and asking for a double double. They seem to get a kick out of that, <laughs> even though it's not something I enjoy drinking. But again, it's a great way to practice. It's a nice low pressure environment and it's a good way to start to build confidence in a new environment for sure mm -hmm. um so i know something you advocate for and, and you support um your community with a lot is you know helping them with resources with services with with ways that they can you know be supported in their new environment so what are the kind of things we can do to make sure that you know all students have access to the same opportunities the same resources as domestic students and and what are some ways that we can maybe address those gaps or those, you know, disparities that might exist? This is actually a very big topic. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, we wrote an article about uh, the student wage gap. And in the um, study that we referenced, they do mention a few reasons so of the many reasons why students might experience that. But one of them is uh, the lack of network that you know a domestic student would have right. um your mother might know someone else uh, that or uh, her friend from school or a friend from work that can get you an internship um it's just that support system so what we're trying to do is and that's something also in the future what we want to do is have those events mm -hmm. um and try to build a community a community of support for uh international students and you know that's something that also could be done through the teachers or schools uh, we just launched a slack community in hopes that students can come and find their own people and uh, ask questions and get that that sense of community that may we may not have because we haven't been here long enough Right. Uh, so that's one of the things that we try to do. And of course, information. Information is very important. Information is power. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to arm the students, empower them with information so that they know what is available to them and what is not. And um, even if it's so little. Is the language barrier, is that sometimes, you know, a reason for students to not try to access or try to, you know, use services available to them? Absolutely. I think not just the language barrier, not feeling that you don't have that ability to speak and communicate might hold you back from actually going out there and taking something that you feel you deserve. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it is it plays to the confidence itself of the student not just their abilities in speaking English, because communication is very important. And if you feel you can't express, then you just don't put yourself out there. Right, right. You don't, you wouldn't even try, you just give up, right? And then that can, that can have a lot of knock-on effects in terms of, you know, culture shock, homesickness, you know, feeling withdrawn as well, maybe not attending your classes. So, you know, this is, this is something that I've personally dealt with quite a lot as well. When, when things happen in a student's home country, maybe a relative is sick or their parents, you know, they're missing their parents or their family. You know, th this is something that affects affects them quite quite deeply, quite severely. So how can, you know, teachers or maybe people in the community, how can they support international students who might be experiencing homesickness, culture shock? And, and what are some resources that we might refer them to? Uh, I experience culture shock. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I experience um, homesickness a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, when I came to Canada, my country was at war. So my family were, you know, 
constantly sending me messages. If there's internet, I'm able to communicate with them. If there's no internet, then, you know, I have to go to class very stressed out and uncertain of the safety of my family members. Um, and one thing I know it might, it might sound a little silly, but food, food always made me feel better. Uh, just like, you know, I, I couldn't really find my food here because we don't have a community, a Yemeni community here, but the closest thing to me was Ethiopian food. So I, I went and I sat and I, you know, had some Ethiopian food and I talked to uh, the owner of the restaurant and, you know, we built that relationship that we've had for the past six years. Another thing is, uh, for example, my husband was uh, teaching, he was a business instructor, and he found out that with Japanese students, mm -hmm. before an exam, it's considered good luck to give them Kit Kats. Oh, there we go. I didn't know that. So what he did, he, every time before an exam, he would bring Kit Kat and he'll give it to the whole class. So this way, uh, the students can feel you know, little home, uh, Japanese students can feel a little homesick and uh, other students can learn about, you know, one piece of their culture. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one thing that teachers can do. But um, there's also beyond the classroom, having someone professional to talk to, a counselor or someone at school that's, you know, professional, they can um, be more open to them. Right. But then there's also the cultural aspect of it. And I know I, I might sound like a broken record, but a lot of students uh, from different cultures fe don't feel okay speaking to a professional or talking about mm -hmm. their um, emotions or feelings. So I, I think that a buddy system would be great. You know, like someone that's been there a little longer from their same culture that could become you know, some sort of a... Um, that uh, someone that can support students right. and talk to them and then perhaps push them to speak to a professional. And I, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> oh, absolutely. That's fantastic. I, I think we really underestimate the power of food. Um, mm -hmm. And if you're used to, you know, eating with your family, having family meals, having that, you know, familiar food with the, because food doesn't just bring out, you know, emotional responses it brings out you know your memories and your connections and you know it, it brings out a lot of different senses and if you suddenly by yourself in a strange country with strange food let's let's say for some canadian dishes anyway um it can be very very you know unsettling and very very difficult to adapt to so i totally agree with that and i think as well like trying to do little things like okay how much does you know how much do 20 kit cats cost maybe ten dollars okay small thing but that will make a huge difference and really help build that connection build that trust you know help your students invest in you so i think those are really simple and easy strategies but they make a huge difference um again like little things that i do that i don't need to is you know recognizing students who make that extra effort or they go the extra mile you know maybe emailing them with a gift card from time to time just to recognize that achievement or you know just just even just highlighting you know i I thought you did, you know, a really excellent job with this. And these are some reasons why I'm being specific. Um, you know, I think feedback is really important as well. So this is what I wanted to ask you about next, Rafa. Um, what are some ways that international students should, you know, receive feedback? Because as teachers, we tend to give feedback in a very general way. Um, in, and that's not, not just in terms of work, but in terms of, you know, behavior or things that we want to model, expectations. So what are some things that we should we could consider when maybe setting expectations setting assignments working with students in terms of giving feedback how could we navigate that the more specific the feedback is and more detailed the better mm -hmm. uh, we have to still remember that uh, we as humans in general we feel shame and embarrassment when we feel we did something wrong mm -hmm. and it, it's amplified with you know different cultures than right. others. Um, so a detailed feedback, pro preferably one-on-one -on -one, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just making sure that it stays positive. And when giving that feedback, perhaps using real life um, scenarios. 
Yes. You, know, you you wrote this or you said this in a certain way, but you can say it in another way, for example, this and this and this. Mm -hmm. I think that could help a lot. Yeah. So the applications for real life beyond the classroom. So let's say like the, the example you gave earlier, business students. Okay. So we're learning about negotiation. So for you, let's say, for example, Rafa, you're going to be working uh, in HR and talent acquisition. So for you, you could use these expressions to help you do X, Y, Z, right? Is that is that kind of what you're getting at? Yes. Um, like you said, in business, we learned a lot through case studies. Mm -hmm. um, we practiced a lot of experiential learning. So we worked with real life uh, businesses. We, can, we were as consultants for some of them. Uh, they've had some competitions in the classroom for like a, a, a digital marketing proposal. Um, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it is very, it's very useful to have that real life experiences. When I taught marketing, I took permission from the school, I took my students, and uh, we went to the mall, Pacific Center, and that's where I took them to <laughs> Lush. And mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, uh, tell me what it, what are you experiencing? What is this brand trying to tell you? And we practiced and we, while experiencing it, we managed to talk about some of the theories uh, from the classroom. So real life situations and uh, scenarios do help a lot. Uh, and, and that's like feedback and learning. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think as well, another thing I would, I would share as well with, with teachers is, you know, if you know that you're working with students from certain, you know, certain backgrounds, certain cultures, maybe something you're not as familiar with, maybe ask them, oh, like, for example, right now, I know there's, you know, there's certain festivals coming up. So I have students from Iran who are going to be celebrating Nohruz. Okay. I didn't know what Nohruz was a few years ago, but I asked, I learned, I, I tried to do some research and I tried to incorporate it into my classes. Why? Because they can teach me. They are motivated. They're more excited. It's, they can apply the skills from English and they can put that, you know, into things that they want to talk about that they're interested in. So those are some little things you can do. And I like, you know, making it as real as possible, trying to, you know, think about those real world applications. I think that's really powerful. Um, another, you know, major thing that is very important, um, especially for students moving to new countries, um, you know, in, in places like the US, Canada, the UK, we always look at this idea, this concept of critical thinking, which is something we've mentioned quite a lot, and being resilient and being able to solve problems independently. Because as strange as this might sound, we might have some students who are, you know, 18, 19, 20, they might not have lived outside of their home. They might not have had to do that much in terms of real life. And then suddenly they're an international student without all those luxuries or, you know, things that they've enjoyed before. So how can we as teachers, how can we help these students develop critical thinking skills and, and problem solving skills to help them? Maybe not just in an academic setting, but also, you know, in their daily life, because they kind of go together. We, um, we do travel young. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, especially with ESL, I think a lot of the students here are still teenagers, uh, right. 18, 19. And I think a useful tool to do is for students to go back, um, reflect on their own abilities, you know, mm -hmm. figure out what, what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses, what are, what are their limitations. And based on that information, teachers can work with the students and give them more of the workload, but to create like a plan, um, a plan for them to reach their goals. For example, I, I want to pass this class, you know, mm -hmm. so, but I'm, I'm, I'm falling behind. Let's find out why I'm falling behind my other classmates. Is it because whatever it takes them four hours to study or to learn, it takes me double that. Okay, now how can I work on it uh, to get better? And perhaps um, teachers can, you know, uh, get on board with their plan, um, help, help them, like, support them as they move forward with their plan and give them just feedback so that they know to adjust as they learn. And I think that's a very powerful tool for us to develop critical thinking is when we self-reflect. 
Yes, yes. And but that is wouldn't you say though that is something that you know that you need to learn or you need to be able to to know how to do. Um and that's you know that is a process that does take time and I think as teachers we can support that. Um so this is something that our listeners might be able to incorporate, you know, that that idea of being aware of your behavior and you know what you've done well and being reflective and you know maybe keeping a learning journal or a diary of, you know, how how you're learning um, in the class that could be a really useful way to to hopefully do that. Um and I think when it comes to problem solving skills again, not ideal but we mentioned this, you learn by doing. So mm-hmm. putting your students in those situations, asking them what would you do in this situation? Um what are some things that you might need to think about could be really important. Like experiential learning, I guess we would we would refer to it as well. Yes, absolutely. Yes. 100%. So um I know it wasn't as much of a of a big deal for you necessarily but what would be some ways that um we can support our students to learn or improve their English outside of the classroom are there any specific things that students might get involved in or things that they could join or maybe you know work on um outside of their class to help them with their English You know what um just recently someone that uh, is studying ESL a student He mm-hmm. wrote to me and asked me, "I want to learn English more, like outside of the classroom, because again, ESL teachers do a great job, but then that's five hours of their day. What happens with the rest of the time?" Right. And she came up to me and asked me, "What shows are you watching?" Fantastic. What What do you recommend for me to watch? Um, I was tempted. Well, it depends on the level. You can say watch cartoon because. they tend to use um simpler language but then you know for them to understand also the sense of humor that's re- used in north america mm-hmm. um expressions and emotions and stuff like that i i think entertainment and storytelling is really really important and that helps us a lot with retaining information Yeah, I think TV shows is a really underestimated one and and not just saying to a student, "Hey, listen to this or watch this." Like, here are some specific shows that are going to be great for your level or here's some specific movies that might help you to understand certain concepts. So, yeah, I really like that idea and I think that's great and you know, you've provided some really useful practical tips and, and this is this is really great. I know our audience is really going to appreciate this because many of us work with international students or we have students from different backgrounds and and cultures as well. So, um this is all really really valuable so um you've talked a little bit about thrive and and what you do um so could you tell our listeners how they can connect with you how can they maybe find find the publication and how can they find out more about you and and what you do rafa yeah uh, i encourage all of your listeners to check out our website mm-hmm. uh www.thrive.ca thrive with a double v um see the content uh, that we have uh perhaps point out their students in our direction mm-hmm. we are helping students by empowering them with information um at the end of the day our job is a complement to what you're doing in the classroom and i think together we can help these people thrive in the city absolutely uh, they can also reach out to me on linkedin uh, uh under rafa and mutarrib you know it's a little difficult to spell my last name but uh I think Daniel's can write it in the yes, description. Yes, <laughs> I will just I was just about to say I will add the the links in the description below so you'll be able to to find those and connect with Rafa um if you would like to I, I know she'd love to be able to um share um the wonderful articles and and information that you have um on Thrive. And again, do feel free to reach out. It's not it's not just for people from the Vancouver area, you know. whatever stage you're at even as a teacher or a student is definitely value um in the content on there so we will definitely add those links so you can check it out if you want to all right thank you so much rafa is wonderful to to have you with us today thank you all right thank you so much